guys, so my goal in creating this video is twofold. First, to give you a few exercises you can practice that should hopefully improve your improvisation over time. And secondly, to then give you the tools to create your own exercises. So you can choose to memorize these exercises as licks and then use them verbatim in your solos. Or you can just use them as a springboard or as inspiration for your own licks. So learning these exercises or learning licks in general is an important part of improvisation. Not only does this give you a feel for the type of rhythm and phrasing that is typically used in jazz improvisation, but memorizing licks is also a good fallback option for when you run out of ideas while you're improvising. It's almost like a get out of jail free card. If you ever make a mistake or get lost during a solo, just play a snazzy little lick and people will think you know exactly what you're doing. Now the licks I'm going to be playing are going to be over a 2-5-1 chord progression, simply because it's the most commonly used chord progression in jazz. But with a little transposition, you can apply most of the ideas in these exercises over any chord progression. Now we're going to think about and analyze these licks as a combination of arpeggios, the diatonic scale, and chromatic passing notes. But instead of arpeggiating just plain old seventh chords, we're also going to arpeggiate the available tensions of each chord. So rather than just playing the chord tones, so the 1, 3, 5, and 7 of a chord, we're also going to include a chord's tensions, so the 9th, 11th, and 13th. But not all tensions are allowed over every chord type. Now, I've already covered available tensions in a separate video, but essentially not all tensions are allowed over every chord type. And so the picture-in-picture picture has a brief summary of what tensions are considered available for each of the three main chord types. So over a minor 7 chord, we're allowed to add the 9th, 11th, and 13th. Over a dominant 7, we're allowed to add the flat 9, 9, sharp 9, sharp 11, flat 13, or 13th. And over a major 7 chord, we're allowed to add the 9th, sharp 11th, or 13th. So, for example, over the chord C major 7, we're allowed to add the 9th, the D, the sharp 11th, an F sharp, or the 13th, an A. But we're not allowed to add a D flat, for example, because that would be a flat 9th and therefore not an available tension over a major 7 chord. And as we play these exercises, we're going to pay special attention to the last note of each phrase. So we want a strong resolution for each phrase. And in order to do this, we will finish each phrase either on a chord tone, so the 1, 3, 5, and 7, or an available tension of the chord. And for this video, I'm going to be playing a 2, 5, 1 in B flat. So our diatonic scale we will be B flat major. And I'll also write out each exercise in the picture in picture as I play it. Cool, so the first exercise goes as follows. Right, so this is largely an arpeggio based exercise or lick. But instead of arpeggiating from the root to the seventh, one, three, five, seven, we arpeggiate from the third to the ninth, three, five, seven, nine. And incidentally, that's actually a rootless chord voicing, for those of you who know what that is. So over the C minor 7, we start with a little passing note, a semitone below the 3rd, and then we just play our arpeggio up to the ninth, and then we just walk down the diatonic scale, the B flat major scale. Then we do the exact same thing with the F7, so semitone above the 3rd, arpeggio to the ninth, walk down the scale, and the same with the B flat major. So a semitone below the third, arpeggio up to the ninth, and then walk down the scale. And notice that we're ending each of these little phrases on the seventh of each chord. Right, on the B flat, and then on the E flat, and then on the A. 
So we're finishing on a chord tone or even on a guide tone on the seventh of the chord, which gives us a really strong finish. And you'll also notice that we start each phrase on an offbeat and we end each phrase on an offbeat. So we start on the one end and finish on the four end. So really what the soloist is thinking while playing this little solo is that, okay, let's play an arpeggio from the third to the ninth of each chord, but let's play a little passing note first and then finish on the seventh of each chord. And you could just as easily do the same exercise from the fifth to the eleventh or from the seventh to the thirteenth and then walk down and repeat for each chord. So we've created a simple little arpeggio based lick um, on the first chord, on the two, and then we literally just repeat it on the five chord and on the one chord, but just transposing it up to each chord. And this kind of repetition, it's essentially just a sequence, right? You're playing the same thing, but transposing it to a different chord creates a kind of logic to your solo. It links all the phrases in the improvisation to create an interesting holistic solo. So repetition is really quite important while improvising. Re using repetition or sequences like this is what gives structure to your solo. So you're not just playing random notes all over the place. You've got a clear structure and you're repeating that structure but in this case with transpositions. Cool, now lick number two. So again, as you can see, this uses a lot of repetition. We start on the seventh of each chord, do a little skip up to the ninth, then a little chromatic run before finishing on the root. Then we do the exact same thing with the next chord, the F7, and with the B flat major 7. So we're starting on the 7th, putting a little skip in there, chromatic run, finishing on the root. And so starting and finishing each of our phrases on a chord tone creates a really strong sounding phrase, and one that sounds really resolved. Notice also that we're ending each phrase on an offbeat. And as I just said, there's lots of repetition, which we just transpose to different chords, which again creates that structure and provides those link linkages between the phrases in your solo to make your solo a sort of logical whole rather than just individual random bits. Cool, on to lick number three. So this is a really nice sounding lick. Um, this time we don't have separate phrases for each chord, for each bar. Instead we're playing one long phrase. Notice again that we start and end this phrase on an offbeat. The phrase starts on a root note, on the C, over a C minor 7 chord, and finishes on an A, which is the 7th of the B flat major 7 chord. So again, we're targeting those chord tones. We're starting on a root and finishing on a seventh. And that again is what gives this whole little phrase its nice sounding resolved finish. And in fact, we're encircling the seventh. We're playing a note either side of the seventh before actually hitting it. So we're kind of targeting it in a kind of like roundabout way. B flat, G sharp, A. And again, this lick is largely based around or on arpeggios. So we start on the root, play a little scale run, and then straight into an arpeggio of the C minor 7 chord. Then we get to the F7, and we're essentially playing an arpeggio with a few leaps of the F7 chord, but using the available tensions. So we go sharp 11, 13, 5, 9, 7, and then a little scale run again. And we finish on the B flat major 7 by going 3, 5, 9, 1, passing note 7. So really we're just playing a kind of broken arpeggio, 3, 5, 9, 1, 7. 
we're just adding in that little chromatic passing note to encircle our seventh. So notice we arpeggiate the C minor seven with chord tones, three, five, seven. We arpeggiate the B flat major seven, also largely with chord tones, but the F7 in the middle, we're using a lot of available tensions. The sharp 11, 13, and nine are all in there. And so that creates a little bit more tension over the F7 chord, which is good because that kind of gives us a low tension, high tension, low tension pattern. So we start with no tension, create a bit of tension, and then resolve that tension which is fantastic because ultimately jazz improvisation is all about creating and then resolving that tension. And that's essentially done like this. You play some chord tones, which are very low tension because you're just repeating the chord. Some available tensions, which are outside of the basic seventh chord, but still work because they're available tensions. But that creates a bit of dissonance against the chord, against the basic seventh chord. And then we resolve that tension by playing those chord tones again and just finishing on a seventh. And playing available tensions that are outside of the diatonic scale, in this case the B flat major scale, sounds particularly interesting because it sounds like we're playing outside, but it still sounds good, it still works because we're playing available tensions again. So for example, the sharp 11 over an F7, is a B natural. We obviously don't have a B natural in the key of B flat major. So playing the B natural sounds a little bit out there, sounds a bit interesting and colorful, but it still works because it happens to be an available tension over this chord. So that's a really nice little way to add some color into your improvisation. Use notes that are available tensions, but that happen to fall outside of the diatonic scale. Next, we have lick number four, which goes as follows. Cool, so as you can see, that again is very arpeggio based and it uses repetition. We're essentially playing the same rhythmic phrase three times. So again, that creates those linkages between your phrases in your solo and creates some structure in your solo. Notice also that each phrase ends on an offbeat. And so breaking that down over the C minor seven chord, we're essentially just playing a C minor nine arpeggio from the D down to the C using that arpeggio. Right, so that sounds really nice and low tension. Over the F7, we're also essentially using an arpeggio structure or form or thinking vertically in, in terms of arpeggios but we're going to add in a lot of available tensions to increase the tension of this phrase. So we go flat 13, three, flat nine, 13, flat 13, sharp 11. Right, so there's a lot of available tensions and altered tensions, flat 13s, sharp 11s, flat nines in there. And again, they all work, all these notes work because they're available tensions over this chord but they nevertheless create a bit of tension and a bit of dissonance, which is then very quickly resolved over that B flat major seven chord by going nine, one, seven, five, sharp 11. And we finish that phrase on a sharp 11, which sounds very jazzy and a little bit dissonant. And it has the added benefit of being an available tension that is not in the diatonic scale. So again, it sounds quite colorful and interesting, right? In the B flat major scale, we have an E flat rather than an E natural. And now our final lick goes as follows. So this one's a little bit different. Each chord only lasts half a bar now. And again, we find that it employs arpeggios and then a walking down a scale, a scale run. So we start on the G, which is a fifth, and we essentially just play a C minor seven arpeggio. Then we go to the F seven, 
with a bit of a leap, which always sounds interesting, and then we essentially just walk down the B-flat major scale. Until we finish on the G, which is a 13th over a B-flat major 7 chord, um, which again is an available tension and therefore sounds nice and jazzy if you finish on it. And also notice we finish on an offbeat on the 2 and. Cool, so those are the 5 two, five, one exercises or licks that I wanted to cover. So feel free to memorize these few exercises and use them as licks. Or better yet, use them as inspiration to create your own licks. So hopefully you noticed a few common threads or trends throughout all those different licks. Firstly, they made use of a lot of arpeggios, and especially adding those available tensions, the 9ths, 11ths, and 13ths, into your arpeggio to make it a bit more interesting and jazzy. It also used the diatonic scale, right? The B-flat major scale. As well as a few chromatic passing notes, every now and then. And as I said at the beginning of this video, really you can think of all of these exercises as some combination of those three things. The other thing you would have noticed is that generally we are starting and finishing each phrase on a chord tone or an available tension. And that creates either a really strong resolution or a little bit of a jazzy resolution to each phrase. If you finish a phrase on the root note of the particular chord, it's going to sound really final and resolved because you're hitting the root note. If you finish it on an 11th, it's going to sound a bit jazzier but still quite nice because it's an available tension, you're allowed to use that note. But it's still going to create just that little bit of dissonance which will give it a nice jazzy colourful texture. You also would have noticed a lot of repetition and sequences. And as I've already stated a few times, repetition and sequences are very important in improvisation because that's what gives the improvisation its structure. You're not just playing random notes, you're playing a particular rhythmic phrase or idea and then repeating it, either by transposing it or just repeating it sort of verbatim. That really creates a well-grounded structured solo. You would have also seen that we're generally using and mixing swung eighth notes and triplets. And we're often starting and ending phrases off the beat. Right, and those two things, the using swung eighth notes and triplets and starting and ending off the beat, will give you a really jazzy sounding rhythm and phrasing. Right, so at its simplest, that's all there is to creating licks and improvising. Applying these harmonic, melodic, and rhythmic ideas helps you create a strong sounding improvisation. We're using the appropriate diatonic scale with a few passing notes, we're finishing each phrase on a harmonically strong note, and we're putting in some interesting syncopated rhythms. And putting all these ideas together in your improvisation can get you sounding really smooth and professional and jazzy. Right, so all these little licks and exercises are all really quite conceptually simple. And that's part of the reason why they sound relatively nice, at least in my opinion. Beauty and simplicity are often synonymous. But, of course, we can then add infinite layers of complexity on top of this basic improvisation idea or framework. We can start adding more exotic scales, or cycled patterns, or side slipping, or superimposition, or a whole bunch of other more complex improvisational techniques. But if you just want a nice and strong sounding and simple improvisation, this is the way to do it. And ideally, when improvising, you really should be thinking about your solo like we just analysed these five licks or exercises. You need to know exactly where you are in the song, um, exactly what chord you're on and what chord is coming next, so that you can target a particular note and end your phrase on a particular chord tone um, and play up a particular arpeggio up to the ninth and so on. Now this of course takes a lot of practice. Most people when they start improvising just begin noodling in the diatonic key. 
So that's a good way to start improvising and to get used to the sound of that particular scale over that particular chord progression. Right, it's a 2-5-1 in B flat, therefore I can just noodle a few things on the B flat major scale. But really, that way of thinking about an improvisation is a little bit simplistic and amateurish. But that's important, right? We all start as amateurs and gradually build up our ability until we're a bit more competent. So ultimately then, the end goal of improvisation is not just to tinker around with the B-flat major scale over a particular chord progression, but to really play intentional, purposeful phrases over each particular chord. So you know exactly what chord you're on, what notes you're allowed to use, what, where the available tensions are for each of those chords, um, where the guide tones are, where the chord tones are, where you can finish, where you can start, how you can connect the arpeggios, what passing notes you can use on your way down to the root note or to the sharp 11th or to the flat 13th and so on. Now obviously that takes a lot of practice. So it's not going to happen overnight. But that's ultimately where you're going. So that every single note you play is a note you intended to play and a note that you purposefully played because it was the ninth of the chord or because it was the sharp 11th of the chord and you're allowed to play a sharp 11 over a dominant chord because it's an available tension. Cool, so have fun with those licks and make sure you make up some of your own based on all the ideas we've discussed here. Otherwise, good luck guys and see you next time. Bye.